Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST for short. My name is Ariel Liji, and I'm CCAST's Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator, and I'm joined today uh, by Carly Jewell from the Fish and Wildlife Service Applications, Science Applications, um, who will be helping me run this webinar, and of course, Michelle Jeffries, our speaker uh, today from the USGS. For those of you who are new to CCAST, CCAST supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species, aquatic restoration, and drought and climate adaptation. Today, we'll be hearing from Michelle Jeffries, who will be telling us about recent updates to the land treatment exploration tool. And as a reminder, uh, these questions will be followed by a question and answer session. So go ahead and save those questions or put them in the chat for Michelle at the end of this presentation. And I'll pass it to you now, Michelle, to share your screen and tell us about the recent updates to the land treatment exploration tool. All right, thank you. I'm gonna keep my camera off. I am unfortunately suffering from a cold. Um, so bear with my nasally self here. All right, so you should be seeing my screen now. Okay, I see a head nod, fantastic. Okay, so before I dig right into the land treatment exploration tool, I wanted to give a very brief background on everywhere this project has been, just to give you a little bit of context. So it's gonna be quick. Let me click on my screen here, there we go, okay. So this whole project, um, this concept of treatment data that we've been working with with the BLM originally started back in 2009. So we've been working on treatment data and the BLM for a long time. And essentially what we've been doing is making the paper data, electronic data that's unorganized, more accessible to the BLM themselves, as well as researchers, public, everyone who's on this call. So how we do that is by visiting all the BLM offices in the Western US, and we go to their offices, dig through their cabinets, identify the information for both tabular and spatial data supporting restoration actions across the West, and we get that entered into a standardized database form that's then served up through many different platforms. Um, and we're gonna be talking about one of those platforms today. So there's over 63,000 treatments, um, so sorry, 62,000 treatments in the LTDL to date. And so um, the date range for this is basically the early 1900s up until very recently. And this is a quick idea of the extent of the data that we have. And so this is just kind of a quick screen capture of the project spatial boundaries. And you can see there's a lot of um, overlap where it's very dark black, and then there's a lot of empty space as well. And the patterns for this is largely driven by two main things land ownership, so this is primarily a BLM treatment database, as well as fire frequency. So kind of keep that in the back of your head today when you think about um, the types of lands that you work on or the region that you work on um, and how these data might uh, be applied to your situation. So the overall key to this treatment data and in, in moving progress forward, um, this is how we view the adaptive management cycle for data for restoration. So the implementation of these treatments for the, the Bureau of Land Management is captured in um, this database called VMAP now. And then they monitor those data with some standardized monitoring. Currently they use AIM, but this monitoring can be, you know, whatever suits the needs for, for the, the stakeholders of a project. And then we're archiving that data so combining the implementation information with all of that monitoring uh, summary. Um, we're archiving it in the Land Treatment Digital Library. And then we're making this information accessible back to the implementation through this platform that we're, we have named the Land Treatment Exploration Tool. And that's the platform that we're really gonna dig into today. So this should be used when you are thinking about um, doing some kind of action on the landscape. This will help you give the context for what you're about to do. So the Land Treatment Exploration Tool is really gonna help you understand the characteristics of your site. It's also gonna help you understand the past treatments that have happened there or nearby or in um, similar ecosystems that share similar characteristics. It's gonna help you create maps, summaries, reports, and all of this can be used um, to facilitate communication or to give justification for, for what you're trying to do out on the landscape. 
So the key updates, and I'm going to go over these, uh, we're going to do a live demo today, fingers crossed, um, but I'm going to emphasize a few of the key updates that we just released. So we increased accessibility. So for screen reader technology, we've done a lot of improvements um, with ADA compliance. We've also added um, a pretty spiffy monitoring tab where we're tapping into some of that standardized AIM monitoring. We've also included some time series vegetation cover. So that's using remote sensing data. And then um, some of the report output upgrades. So here we go. We're going to switch to a live demo. Hopefully this all goes well. <laughs> all right. So here's the land treatment exploration tool. And so this is the general feel of the page. And um, there are some tabs at the top here that you might find useful. So home, about, contact. We're on the start planning page. And then there's a full user guide. So before I dug into this page, I just wanted to take a step back to the About tab. So if you ever have questions, um, this is a good tab to go to. We have our fact sheet here, a link to the user guide. It's the same user guide as right here. We also have video tutorials that go through each of the steps. And then this bottom here shows you all of the data that's used in the tool. So if you ever have any question about like, where's that one data layer coming from? You can uh, quickly find it yourself um, and get the service to add to your own map. Okay, so um, here's the tool. On the left side, we have six easy steps. And then this main part here is going to show you all the different aspects of the tool. So today, um, I'm going to do a pretend uh, grassland restoration project in the Kurulu grassland up here. Just a random spot I thought of this morning that sounded interesting. So we're going to name our project. Kurulu Restoration 2023. And I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do in this area yet. I'm going to pretend like I'm kind of naive um, into the, the types of treatment that I want to do. So I'm just going to do uh, general rehabilitation for my treatment type. File name is just going to make it the project name here. And then the next step is to create or upload the spatial boundary. Um, so if you have a project that you're already working with, you can upload it here as a zipped shape file. I'm just gonna quickly draw like a pencil in this general area because it looks, looks good. I'm just gonna pretend like I know where to work. Okay. And then you can click on that shape and modify the different boundaries if you want as well. And so I'm gonna move on to the next step here. So this next step, step three, is going to show you the context of the site, mostly through looking at things. So we're not really going to see a lot of statistics right now um, or numbers. It's more viewing things. So this first bit here, site history, is going to take us to the site history tab. And the site history tab is going to give us context first from the perspective of restoration. So what prior treatments have happened in this area and what's the frequency of those actions? So this figure right here is showing you the land treatment digital library data. And it's showing you the frequency of treatment in the shades of blue. So the darker the blue, the more times that area has been treated. So we can see there have been some prior restoration actions here. And if we look at this map right here, just to the right of it, it is showing you the type of treatment those things were. So it looks like there have been a lot of seedings that have happened here, um, but also a little bit of herbicide application. So right away, I know nothing about this area, but I already know that we've invested some time and money um, in this area before. So this table that's found below this section is going to show you the links and those specific treatments that have happened in this area. So these names here are hyperlinked. And if I click one of these, it'll take me to the Land Treatment Digital Library website, where it has all of the details, um, all the way down to things like seed list, seed vendor, implementation details. Um, and I can see that um, these two uh, overlap. So it looks like a fire in 1983 and a fire in 2017 occur in about 10% you know, of my current planned boundary. So it's probably you know, one of these larger shapes in here. I can take some notes on the prior treatments in here if I want. And these notes will be carried through to the report that I export. So we're going to dig into treatments a lot more near the end of the tool. So this is just where we see what's happened directly within that treatment area, but not necessarily searching for information that's happened nearby. 
So the next bit in site history is gonna show you the context of the area in regards to wildfire. So has this area burned before and how many times has that area burned? So it's showing you frequency of fire. Um, so this area down here is burned. That's probably that wildcat fire that we saw in the past. Um, some areas have burned more than once, uh, but you know, for a large part, a lot of it hasn't uh, had a record of fire. You can also take some notes here. And then we get into a little bit about the climate. So this is showing you 30 year prism data. So this is average monthly temperature and precipitation for that polygon that I drew. So this could be helpful if you're trying to seed something that has very specific germination thresholds, for example, you might wanna make sure that you're trying to you know, seed that species when it has a good chance of meeting those temperature precip thresholds. This last bit here is giving you some information on drought. So this is one of the many different drought indices. Um, so this is a reference time period. This is showing the standard deviation. So how variable the area is for drought. And then um, here at the bottom, we link to some of the most important drought resources. So we're not um, duplicating effort. We're linking to you know, the important resources that are out there like the US Drought Monitor, for example, where you can see the current and uh, projected, you know, is the drought going to persist conditions? And of course, another text box to add some notes about drought. So that was just the first bit here. If I keep going through step three, um, the next piece is going to say, hey, take a look at the monitoring tab. So this is one of those new updates that we're gonna highlight today. So here's, <clears throat> excuse me, the brand new monitoring tab. So what this is showing us is here are all the, the BLM AIM monitoring data. So this is a standardized protocol that they've been implementing for several years. And these green and blue and pink dots here are showing you those data. So if I zoom out, just to give you a little bit of perspective of the data that's in AIM, take a second to render. Um, there's a lot of data that's captured in this database. So I'm gonna zoom back in. So, what this is searching for are AIM data points directly within and within 10 miles of that planned polygon that I drew. So again, I know nothing about this area, but here I go, I can actually find on the ground monitoring data that's happened. Um, we got some 2017 data that's happened directly in there, some 2020 data. Um, yeah, it looks like 2020 and 2017. And I can even see percent cover of different functional groups. I can see the species that were found at those plots. So for example, um, if I don't know what some of these plants are, uh, maybe I'm unfamiliar um, you know, with this particular species. If I click this little pill here, it'll actually take me to the USDA plants database for that species so that I can um, view the summaries and understand what plants have been observed there quite easily. So if I want some of these data to carry through to my report, um, I can check this box. And you'll also notice when I'm selected on a line here, it'll highlight that plot in the map. Um, the same thing will happen if I click this, it'll show me the data and it'll highlight it. Um, it's on a different page, but it'll highlight it in the plot down here. So this is showing you all of the data that it's served up from these AIM data. So there's quite a bit of data in here. Those tables are showing you um, some, a quick summary of, of the, the most important fields like the functional group cover in this species. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next bit here for time's sake. Um, so the next part of step three says, hey, take a look at uh, protected species. So that's gonna take us over to the Fish and Wildlife Information for Planning and Consultation tool over here, this IPAC tab. So what this tab is gonna show us, and for some reason, I think the screen shares make it grumpy. Let me put this one here. Okay, so I preloaded this in another tab just in case something like that happened. Um, so here's the IPAC tab for this polygon, and it's showing us the uh, species of conservation concern according to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So that's gonna show us things like um, endangered species and migratory birds, as well as wetlands. And I can click this link here that's created and it's gonna take me to their tool. So we're just tapping into an existing resource here. Again, not duplicating effort, but utilizing existing resources. So here's that polygon right here. And here's the data that we were summarizing here as well. So we have monarch butterfly, a couple migratory birds of concern. Here's monarch butterfly, 
here are those migratory birds of concern. Here's any facilities they'll show up here, um, as well as wetlands. Their wetland service is constantly having issues, but if you click try again, sometimes it'll pop up, but that'll show you any um, streams, rivers uh, of any kinds in the area. All right. So the next bit is going to take us to the planning map, which is so we were right here on this plan treatment tab and it toggled us over to layers legend and it toggled us to the planning map, which is actually where we started. That's how we drew this shape. But essentially, it's just encouraging you to take a look at the different data layers that we have. So we have over uh, 60 different data layers that you can turn on within these uh, sections here. So, for example, you know, eco regions or ownership you know, seed zones. Uh, here are land treatments, for example. So we've been looking at the land treatment digital library data. So here are um, those polygons that we were seeing in the site history tab. We can also turn them on in this planning map and we can identify to get a little bit of the information about those right here. We can also see that the land treatment digital library isn't the only treatment database in town. So we have a very comprehensive BLM treatment database across time and space, but there's also you know, some state databases. For example, Utah has a great state database where they have a cross stakeholder. So this will include some private, some forest service, some state. It will also include BLMs. So you'll notice there's BLM data that we have as well. And New Mexico has one as well. So if you guys, um, I know there's some people on the call likely from New Mexico. Um, New Mexico has a great stakeholder database as well. Um, so yeah, there's lots of layers you can dig in through here. You know, we have the GSERGO data nested in here. Um, if you're interested in sage grouse, we have a whole sage grouse section. And some people really dig into this part. Some people gloss right over it. Just depends what you're focused on. So the next uh, and last step of step three says, hey, take a look at the drought conditions um, for your site. So I, this takes about four minutes to run. So I pulled it up earlier on this one, drought forecast. So here's our area and it's a point-based model. And what this model does is it calculates the past six months and the future 12 months for the potential drought conditions. So it's looking at soil moisture, temperature <clears throat> and precipitation. And what it creates are these interactive figures here where I can look at how do the conditions right now compare to normal. So for this particular location, the uh, volumetric water content has actually been uh, pretty good, pretty high, more than average um, in many cases, <clears throat> which makes sense. We've had a pretty good wet streak up here at least. And I can also change this for different soil depths. So this is showing you the shallow soil depth, but we can also change this to intermediate um, and deep soil as well. So same kind of figures for temperature and precipitation. So showing you deviations from average for both of those variables as well. And then if you're in an area with sagebrush, we also have some sagebrush metrics. So these are taking um, some models from current literature and it's taking the data from that coordinate and using the models from the literature to try to estimate what's the probability of sagebrush establishment. And so we can compare that to average conditions um, looking backwards and looking forward. So the forecasted establishment for 2023 um, is decent, but not better than average. Um, and we don't have enough data for 2024 because we just started 2023. So based on this paper, you know, decent, not great. Um, and then some other metrics will show you how do the conditions compare um, when you look at some specific variables such as soil water potential and soil temperature. So this is comparing that point location to sites across the Great Basin where sagebrush was or was not successful in establishing after seeding. And we also have um, some other metrics here for sagebrush establishment under no disturbance conditions. So this tab is really exciting because we are going to be expanding this to include other species. Um, so that work just started this year. So we're going to be including things um, like some other grass and forb species that are commonly um, seeded. So we just started that project, so it won't be so sagebrush focused moving forward, as well as it's not going to be a point based model. We're actually going to turn this into a um, essentially like a mapping product where you can view these metrics across space. Um, so 
keep tuned for that in the next couple of years. Um, all right, so moving on to step four. Step four is where we take a subset of the data that we were just looking at, and we're actually going to calculate some statistics off of that. So I'm just going to click select all here. So this is a subset of the data layers that we had in this layers legend. And it's actually going to take this polygon and it's going to overlay it with all of these data and show us those stats. So this list was curated by the BLM. And so this was a list that essentially they asked for. Um, it's a dynamic list. We're adding quite a few layers this year. Um, but they kind of represent the most important data that a lot of you often think about. So things like soil temperature and moisture regime, um, fire risk, land fire vegetation type and cover, heat load, ruggedness, ecological site name, um, a lot of sage grouse data is in here as well. And at the bottom, we're gonna have some remote sensing data. So you can see these tables were kind of populating as I was scrolling. So this is all done on the fly. So it's taking that dynamic shape that I just drew, sending it to a server and it's calculating these data for us. Um, <clears throat> a few of these do take a couple more minutes than others. So for example, PRISM and the remote sensing data we'll come back to because it just takes a few minutes. This bottom part right here, another note box, because um, this is still a ton of information. This is all summary data, but there's a lot of summary data here. So there might be specific pieces of this that you might want to pull out um, in these notes. So you might, you know, want to talk about the, you know, the most common ecological site name here, or uh, maybe that it's almost entirely this one heat load category, you know, things like that. All right. So the last two steps of the tool um, are where we're going to actually search and compare to prior restoration actions in the land treatment digital library. So not just those that occur directly within my boundary, but let's look beyond that and try to find some information that might be helpful to help me determine what I should or maybe should not do in this landscape. So there's you know, over 62,000 treatments in the LTTL. So we're gonna first um, determine how far should I search for data? So we're just gonna do this buffer distance for ease today, but you can also search um, you know, by like ecoregion or MLRA or you know, field office, for example. But we're just gonna do a distance and we're just gonna search some buffer away from this um, shape here that I drew. So I'm gonna change this to mm, 40 miles. We're going to look for data within 40 miles of this polygon. And I'm not going to click these today because they take a few minutes, but you can pairwise compare this treatment to all of the returned data in this perimeter search here by climate, heat load, and landform. So you can find the ones that are most similar by those attributes. So right now we just started the query and it's going to find all of the land treatment digital library data here. So you can see them starting to highlight. And then it's going to toggle us over to this results tab where we're going to have a table of data. And that table of data is then going to be filtered in the next step. There we go. So we found 531 treatments within that 40 mile distance. And we get this table here that summarizes the land treatment digital library. So we have some values going across the top here. So we uh, quickly show you know, the project name, the general treatment category, and the treatment type in the year. And then this part over here is actually showing a ton of information and we simplify it with some colors. So generally green is better than yellow, um, but there's lots of codes in here as well. And you can click this little info button to see what those codes are actually meaning. But you can see you know, there's, there's quite a bit of yellow in some of these. And why that happens is because we often have imperfect information about these treatments. You know, we're piecing together these the details of these treatments based on whatever was written down and that we were able to find in an office. Um, so sometimes it might be a casual mention of, oh yeah, we seeded this area, but we might not know where or something like that. So we can filter um, these 530 treatments by some fields to help narrow it down. So I like to first narrow it down by uh, those treatments that there was something written down about how well it did. Um, so that's um, definitely not always the case where we know how well treatments did. So I'm just going to select yes here. And so that's going to filter it to those with something written down in the results uh, field. So actually quite a few, 136 treatments have something written about how well they did. Um, this could be anywhere from like, we drove by and it looks good to, you know, we had three plants per square meter at all these plots. Um, the, the results can be pretty variable. But let's take a look at what some of these um, are. So here's a random one here. It looks like a post wildfire 
aerial seeding. So I click this little plus button and it's gonna open up some treatments, uh, some details about that treatment. So we can see um, this was a helicopter aerial seeding that happened in the spring of 2008. And I can see the objectives for the treatment, what they actually did, so their actual implementation, as well as notes about how well the treatment did. So this treatment results field. So this is often a summary of their monitoring and some uh, monitoring and summary reports. So that's where they're actually using that aim data to say something about a treatment. So here's another one of the new features that we just released. So here's that time series vegetation cover graph. Um, so this is showing you vegetation data for this aerial seeding. So we can look back at this seeding and actually see what, what's been going on with the vegetation through time. So this is based off of Landsat. Um, and so, you know, it only goes back to 1985. Um, that's when the satellites were first launched. And 2012, here you'll notice a gap is missing in this iteration because that's when the, the striping issue happened, if you've ever used uh, Landsat imagery before. Um, so that's skipped in this model. So what these data are showing you are functional group cover categories. And this is um, modeled again, starting with Landfire and then uses a bunch of neural networks and um, different types of models to, to estimate these different functional groups. And that's what these lines are showing you. So if I hover over it here, I can see in 2003, this aerial seeding area, the average bare ground cover, you know, was about 54%. So I can look at these different lines in here as well, these vertical lines. So these vertical lines are showing you other types of information. So the dashed red line is showing you years when a fire happened. And then the black vertical lines are showing you years of treatment. Um, so a fire happened, we knew that this was post wildfire seeding, it happened in 2007. This aerial seeding happened in the spring of 2008. And so you can actually see that response of fire, bare ground increase, all the vegetation decreased. That's an obvious response. We can also look at water year precipitation. So that might help give you context and some of the patterns that you're seeing. So these bars are showing you the water year precipitation. So that's October to October for a given growing year. And you can turn any of these off. So let's say, okay, obviously bare ground goes up after fire. I don't care. I wanna look at the other variables more closely. So I can click on that legend and it'll turn it off and it'll rescale the Y axis. Um, so you can, you know, take a look at these different specific things. So maybe I just want to look at annual herbaceous cover and sagebrush cover. What happened after the fire? And we can see that, you know, annual herbaceous ended up very high, but it was kind of on an upward trajectory anyways. Um, and shrub cover obviously uh, tanked after the fire, um, but it was also recovering. So that's pretty nice. So even if there was nothing written in this results field, for example, we can look at these data through the lens of the satellite and try to see if we can pick up some of these vegetation responses. And then just at the bottom here, um, we do have the seed list. So this particular seeding uh, was a forage grisha seeding. All right, and if I wanna see where that seeding happened on the map, so I can click this little zoom button here and it's going to take me back to this planning map. And this planning map is going to look a lot different than it did before because it's going to have a bunch of highlighting on it. So one thing to remember is we've filtered down and we have selected one. So I'm going to go to this one here and we see some different colors. So here's our buffer. Everything in white includes those 500 and some treatments. Everything in green is showing you what my filter is showing me. So those 130. And then this blue one here is showing you the one that I have selected that I just zoomed to. So that's why we're seeing these different colors. So I can kind of get an idea, okay, that one happened, you know, in this Rock River Valley. And I can kind of think about, you know, am I familiar with that area? Do I know more information just by thinking about its location? Um, sometimes you can look at these, these data and start to think, oh, well, that's clearly in a different ecological area because it's, you know, on top of the Black Pine Mountains or something. Um, but it's sometimes helpful to see where those are on the landscape. So if I go back to my results tab here, we can um, check some of these. Um, so let's see. Sure, we'll grab this prescribed burn. 
So maybe there's something useful in this prescribed burn treatment. Maybe that they had a great vegetation response after they did a prescribed burn in 1985. Um, so saying, hey, a prescribed burn worked here in the past, maybe it'll work here again. So that's good justification potentially uh, for trying to implement that type of treatment. You might also find treatments in here where they completely failed. And so, you know, I want to say, mm, man, this one, looking at the results and the vegetation response, they didn't get what they wanted. So maybe we shouldn't do that type of treatment here in this case, or we're going to do it this way, but slightly different because in the past, you know, they had mixed results. So we're searching through these data to, to glean that type of information. So it's not just relying on your local knowledge that's in your head or in your office, you know, you're crossing boundaries. And if, if you work for the state or for the forest service, you can cross these boundaries into the BLM, right? So we're really tapping into the depths of the BLM knowledge here. And you don't need to be a BLM employee to, to gain information from this. So by checking these, and I have um, some monitoring data checked as well. I have it pulled up on this tab here already because it takes a few minutes to generate. So from this view on the report tab, by clicking preview report, it's gonna create this kind of quick print preview, right? That you're used to seeing on different things. And that just takes a few minutes to build. It's gonna plop in all these maps and legends dynamically here, but just to skip that few minutes, I have it pulled up right here. And one of the, the last updates that I wanted to focus on here was we really increased the speed of this report prints. So it was one of our pinch points um, for folks that they'd hit print and then it would take like three minutes to print. Um, well, now when you click print, uh, it opens automatically, very quickly, and it prints like within three seconds. It's fantastic. Um, so not as exciting and flashy as, you know, the cool figures that we added, but it is it was a big pain point. So I just want to emphasize we did resolve the uh, print problem that we were having. Okay, so that's basically the full demo and I wanted to leave a lot of time to have a discussion with the community here because I know um, this example was in Utah, a lot of the practitioners on this call uh, might be in Arizona or New Mexico or Texas. So I want to focus some of this discussion hopefully on how we can provide information that will help the work that's happening in other ecosystems, because unfortunately for for some of the fringe ecosystems in the West, a lot of the research, a lot of the money, as you know, has been spent on the sagebrush ecosystem. And a lot of the data that drive this tool are sagebrush focused, like those sage grouse layers or um, you know, sagebrush establishment forecasting, different things like that. So this is a great opportunity for me to, to touch base with non-sagebrush focused folks, maybe on this call, to try to figure out where should we be thinking to to further you know, the functionality for the problems that you guys are facing. So I will leave it there and pause for a minute and quickly look at the chat. Okay, so Trisha had a question <clears throat> about Arizona. So she mentioned that Arizona um, didn't have a lot of treatments on the map that I was showing. So let's take a look at that. Um, any map. So I'm going to turn on the LTDL here. We're going to go south. So there's a few reasons why you might not see as much of the data as you might expect for a given area. And I tried to hit on that a little bit when I was talking about the map. This might take a second to draw this extent. We'll see. I can also pull it up here. So here's Arizona down here. We have some more going on in New Mexico. A lot of why you see these big gaps in Arizona are largely land ownership. Um, so again, this is the land treatment digital library in itself is focused on BLM treatment data. And I know there's a lot of work that's done through other avenues um, in Arizona specifically. Um, so how we've tried to address some issues like that where the BLM data falls um, a little bit short 
um, in some of these areas, just because of who's doing the restoration, you know, we do have these other sources of data, but data are only available where they exist. So Arizona doesn't have that I'm aware of another source of treatment data that's publicly available. That's a big piece there. So Utah has a publicly available state database that covers, you know, some private, some public, different stakeholders. Um, New Mexico has one as well, but I'm not familiar with Arizona. If there is one that might exist, we should talk um, and maybe work to get, you know, some of those data public so people can actually um, view the data and use it in a tool like this. Um, you know, so if you're you know, working in New Mexico here, here's some forest service treatments right here that we wouldn't have in the land treatment digital library. And we can also turn on, you know, forest service data. Let's see if we have any in Arizona. We have some forest service treatment data in here. I don't see any showing up there across the border. So we only can have data where data exists is kind of the, the grand story of that one. All right, let's turn on, okay, Kelsey Davis asked, can you explain the similarity model pairwise comparison? Sure, that is essentially a Euclidean distance. Um, so it's a Bray-Curtis dissimilarity. So it's taking those variables for climate, heat load and landform. And it's essentially just comparing each of those categories um, against each other with that Bray-Curtis dissimilarity. And I can um, provide more information about that, but we also have a bit more in the user guide and a link to the citation for, for what that specific pairwise comparison is. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, good question. Um, all right, next question from Valerie. Um, she asks if this can be used on other land ownership. Um, yes, because a forest service employee can still learn from what the BLM does or a state uh, stakeholder can still learn about what the BLM does. And so what we're trying to do with this tool is to really break down those jurisdictional boundaries of states and field offices and land ownership and just say like a seeding happened here, these were the results. Um, and we're BLM focused because we've been BLM funded to do this project since 2009. Um, they've been very forward thinking uh, with, with data management, um, so kudos to them. Uh, any discussion for the USDA and DOI to team up? Um, there are certainly pushes for DOI level treatment effectiveness um, to, there was a lot of conversation about that at the end of 2022 actually at a high level. And there might be funding coming down the pipe for things like that. I know they were trying to, to look into things like NIF pours, if they could make that better because NIF pours is a cross DOI system, um, but I don't know where that's ended up. It definitely, um, it takes a lot of time and money to get where we've gotten here, but it's certainly very possible to do across DOI if there's enough of a push to do it. Um, all right, for Arizona, it would be useful to have the wildfires displayed. Sure, let's do that. Let's just turn them on. Let's turn off all this junk that I turned on. Okay, so let's go to the wildfire category here and look at Arizona. So I don't know if it'll be super happy about drawing at this scale, but let's just see. Um, let's try the raster, so might be happier about that. Okay, so here are the, uh, it's the frequency of wildfire. Um, so this data set is one that uh, myself and a couple of partners, the USGS work on, where we're taking information across many different wildfire data sets and combining them to try to remove a lot of the problems with wildfire data. So if you ever tried to work with wildfire data, you've probably noticed that there's like a lot of redundancies and like the perimeter and the attributes and inconsistencies between different data sources. So what we've done is we've done uh, a tiered system where we take information from all of the available data sources and we try to make decisions programmatically about which are best. And then we result um, in one polygon per fire with um, a single set of attributes. And then we create these rasters off of that. 
So now that I've zoomed in, it'll probably be happier about the whole polygon thing. See if it'll render. Um, so the attributes of this data set, we're only showing a couple of them here, um, but we, we acknowledge that the sources of these data are combined from different sources. So this one actually had 21, 22, 23 different sources of data for this um, one Goodwin fire. And it looks like um, it was almost always called Goodwin, but one time it didn't have a name at all. Um, and it came from all of these different uh, data layers here to create um, this one record. And there's, like I said, many other attributes um, that are involved there. And if you ever wanted to use these polygons or the raster data that are created from these polygons, you can always go to the about table and you can search it and find it from here. So here's the data release for those data, for example. Okay, so Meg Cargill had a question. How is resistance and resilience calculated in the step four stats? So step four is just taking existing data layers and overlaying them with that planned polygon. So let's turn this guy off and turn on resistance and resilience. So this is a very generalized product. So this layer is another one of those um, Stage brushy specific layers, unfortunately, for many people down south. I know there is a push to evolve this resistance and resilience model to improve it, but also to expand it. Um, so right now, I believe when they created this, it was clipped to the sagebrush extent, perhaps, or maybe stage grouse extent. Um, we can look here at the resistance. They said. So this is all just publicly available data. So this was published out of the Great <clears throat> Basin Landscape Conservation Cooperative and all the information about it is here. Um, but I know they based that <clears throat> largely off of G-Circo data and then a little bit um, of local knowledge, I think for a few of the areas as well. <clears throat> okay. Sorry, I just need a <clears throat> quick drink of water there. Thanks, Michelle. Um, are there any other questions that folks had that Michelle hasn't gotten to yet? Feel free to unmute and, and just ask your questions if there are a couple that we haven't gotten to. Looks like another <clears throat> question popped in the chat. Can you determine changes in vegetation cover over time? <clears throat> so right now, excuse me, um, we're showing those uh, change for each of those treatments. But as far as saying things have statistically changed, <clears throat> we don't have that in here yet, but we are talking about that. <coughs> Sorry. So for example, um, has, you know, annual herbaceous cover increased or decreased? That's a pretty loaded question for any functional group. And you can tell that a lot of cover oscillates. I mean, it doesn't necessarily follow like a linear trend. So we're working um, with a group of people right now to try to determine how you might define a change based off of these data. Um, but our hope is that, <clears throat> we'd be able to query like in this filter step here for those functional groups. So you could search like, show me treatments where, you know, this functional group has done this thing. <clears throat> um, we don't currently have it, but we are thinking about it. And if you have ideas or methods where you think that would work well for a question like this, um, certainly, you know, pass that along.
Um, looks like Gita mentioned that <laughs> she might be seeing the server bogged down. That is certainly possible. Um, if like a ton of people do use a tool at once, it might get a little grumpy. <laughs> but uh, this is all hosted in the Amazon Cloud, cloud Hosting Services. So technically, um, as use increases, the server that it's hosted on will duplicate and expand for use. Um, but it might, yeah, if a bunch of people are hitting it, 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 it can slow down a little bit. <laughs> um, all right, so Nathan Combs had a question. Any plans to collaborate with the creators of the range of analysis platform and potentially combine some functionality of the two tools? Um, yeah, so there are multiple different uh, remote sensing products that show cover data like this. So the, the type of data that we're showing here is from a group called the Range and Condition Monitoring Assessment and Projection. So they're um, the group that produces the land cover map um, or the MLRC uh, D data, for example, and they're USGS based. So this is why we started with them. So this was our first swing at showing remote sensing data for treatments. And we just stayed local with USGS in this case. I do have visions of allowing people to toggle between different sources of remote sensing data. So, you know, show me RAP, show me RC map, show me land part, because these different remote sensing products will show you different things. So even though they're all based on Landsat, they all have on the ground monitoring data, but their modeling process varies. And so the percent bare ground, for example, might be different from one source than another. And it's not saying, it's hard to say that one, if which one to use in a certain situation because they're all wrong in different ways and they're all right in different ways. And it's very um, situational on when one might be better than the other. And you just have to remind yourself that all data are wrong, all data are generalized, you know, that we're showing here, all GIS data, you know, is fuzzy in some different ways, but it's another line of evidence to get you thinking about things. Um, but yeah, I am thinking about RAP. Um, they've got a great system and uh, great data that they produce as well. Um, and I, I do wanna allow the user to, to view all of those different sources. Thanks, Michelle. Are there any other questions from, from folks on the call? If not, maybe we can turn the, the question to, turn to Michelle's original question that, that she had for us about what information uh, the land treatment exploration tool could provide in ecosystems that y'all are working in uh, outside of the sagebrush ecosystems that could be helpful for your work. Yeah, so, so for example, um, I always struggle with getting people to think bigger than their box. So Wyoming is a good example of that. Wyoming has some, uh, where is Wyoming? <laughs> Having a day, here we go. Um, Wyoming has some fantastic geospatial data. So for example, they map things like migration corridors of big game. They have um, many different predictive layers based off different species in their state. Um, but we don't show any of those data here because it's so confined to Wyoming. And so when we're looking to add information to this tool, it has to at least be at the scale of an ecosystem. So for those of you that are working on these problems, um, just in general, I do encourage you, one, to make your data public. If you're working on mapping products, make them services and think big. If you're modeling something, model it over a region that will be useful. And even if when you model at that bigger scale, it loses some specific inference, do both. Do it at the scale where it's perfect or better. And then also across a larger space where more people could use it. Um, so as we're thinking about the problems down here, you know, think big in this conversation. Um, oh, and Valerie in the questions, there you go. I'm thinking big landscapes related to wildlife connectivity. I agree. So I've actually talked with um, the folks in Wyoming and there's, there's an initiative now um, with some of these states in here 
to connect, like, for example, that wildlife corridor data. But as you might imagine, it's very, there's like a lot of politics involved and like caller data and, you know, the data built off of that because of data sharing agreements and yada, yada, yada. But there are pushes, you know, for things like that to happen. Um, and as soon as those bigger scale things are published, you know, we're trying to gobble up essentially all this wonderful work that people do and, and present it in this centralized platform. So send me, send me things as you guys learn about them. Um, if it's something you think we need on this application. So there's a Northern Arizona Connectivity Alliance group. Yeah, so I wonder if they're familiar with that, that corridor project. That, Cause I know it's happening more in these states but I wonder if Arizona's part of that. Is there anybody on the call today who's working with connectivity or with the Northern Arizona Connectivity Alliance or working with that sort of wildlife corridor data? Oh, Valor says, yes, we are. Fantastic, sort of okay. Wildlife corridor data. Oh, Valor says, yes, we are. Fantastic, okay. Yeah, we. I, I'm a, I'm a co-founder of that group, so I'm pretty familiar with kind of what we're doing, but I, I what I'm trying to figure out is how we could leverage this tool um, in particular related to some of the forest service lands that we're working on. And so that's what I've, I mean, this is an amazing tool and I'm just trying to think of how we might be able to use it um, kind of in my world. But the, the work that the, the NALCA group is doing is much broader than forest service. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, initially was created to kind of align um, management and restoration work across the three national forests Prescott, Co Coconino, and Kaibab in Northern Arizona. But of course, it's it's going off on, onto other land jurisdictions as well. Right, so maybe it's getting back to that point I was talking about is like come up with some kind of system or model, even though you're gonna lose some inference by going bigger, it's still worth it. So for example, like for sage grouse, you know, we can have layers that map the probability of sage grouse breeding habitat. You know, you could envision a layer like this that's large ungulate, you know, resistant surface. And it's not gonna be perfect everywhere, but it's gonna be better than nothing. Um, and this layer is an example where it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. Um, so trying to think in these big ways where you can have multiple tiers of products where you have like very strong inference projects for specific areas and you know broadening it out. Um, and then also when you do that, you get interest and the people are like, oh, look at this Westwide thing. How can I invest my time and money into this to make it better? Um, so it's really good to get things out there and get the conversation moving in that direction. Well, so what is, oh, go for it, Michelle. Sorry, I interrupted you. I was just going to say, you know, what are the big conservation problems that are happening down here? It's a lot of um, shrub encroachment and, and uh, loss of grassland, right? That's what's going on down in this zone. Yeah, that's certainly something we hear a lot is people who are trying to restore grasslands, um, <laughs> managing, managing for shrub cover. Mesquite is a is one of the predominant sort of mm. shrub encroachers in the southeastern Arizona area, extending into some of New Mexico and in, and in Texas as well. Yeah, I know a lot of the LTDL treatments in New Mexico, at least a lot of those are shrub uh, shrub removal. I think a lot of it's creosote, maybe something like that. I can't remember, but a lot of these purple um, that's herbicide of shrubs. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's probably the Restore New Mexico, the BLM's Restore New Mexico initiative. Um, and I think that's correct that a lot of it was creosote, other, other species as well, but it's a huge initiative. Okay. An interesting project. Well, I hope that this community, you know, thinks about, you know, what mapping and data products could we serve up to help fill information gaps um, at, you know, this scale. Uh, to help feed into, you know, what data do you wish you had? We went through this process for one of your projects. What are we missing? 
Um, so yeah, I'll post my email in the chat. So if you think of anything, you know, send it our way. We can, you know, keep this conversation moving forward. We're definitely an adaptable team. Thank you so much, Michelle. Yeah, this has been really great. And the, oh, sorry, Gita saying a lot of BLM treatments in Southern Arizona. Yeah, we might wanna, we, we might be able to connect you to some of the, the folks who have BLM treatments data that might not be integrated as well for, for Southern Arizona. Um, yeah, so there is one big caveat too with the LTDL. Um, if you remember, um, we have data from going to those offices and I can say we have not been to Arizona since 2012, I think. We are going back. We just started traveling again. Um, I was just traveling last week. Um, so we'll be going back to all these places to get their most recent data. So it might be that some of the treatments that have happened in the last like eight or nine years are not actually in here because we haven't been there to get the data in a bit. Um, but we're going back. We'll be there soon. Be in a town near you very soon. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So thank you so much for posting your, your email there. We will uh, make a little webinar summary with all this information, the discussion in the chat, some of the tools, resources, questions that people had in here. Thank you again, Michelle. Um, really appreciated it. We'll post those those links and send if anybody, anybody who registered for this webinar will get the link to the recording as well as that summary in the Grassland Community of Practice public folder. Um, Please do let us know if there are other speakers or presentations or topics that you want to hear about. Feel free to write to me, to Ariel. Um, my, you should all have my email at this point. Thank you so much for your time and joining us today, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thanks again, Michelle.